It is so good to have you guys here tonight. We have more than a handful of people who are back with us for the first time in a long time. And we are very, very thankful for that. Yes, very much. And we're just glad that you're here. So I would invite you to take your Bibles. We're going to jump right into this tonight because I've got some things I want to share. I want to make sure you understand this. Go to the book of Ephesians. If you have your Bible, if you have your smartphone, let's go to the book of Ephesians. Uh, if you don't have either one of those, it's going to be on the screens on either side of me here. And I know for some of you, this is the first time you've been here since we rearranged everything. So uh, we're just going to keep doing that. You never know when we're going to throw a table or two up. And, and, you know, you don't get to sit at a table unless you come early. Just a little hint, thought there, okay? Just thought we would do that. So we're going we're gonna to get into this section. Ephesians chapter 2 is actually a part of a larger section that we started looking at last week. We were in Ephesians chapter 1. And the Apostle Paul was talking to us about the incredible mercy and the incredible grace that God has given us. So we're going to pick this up in verse 8 and read down into verse 9. So uh, let me read this out loud for us. Verse 8. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. We're going to stop there. We'll come back to that in just a moment. We've spent the last four weeks talking about the importance of knowing what you believe and why you believe it. And while there are a variety of beliefs and positions within Christianity that Christians may differ on, hard to believe that Christians could differ on anything, right? Yeah, right. Uh, but you, you know the topics, these... Um, yeah, baptism, the Lord's Supper, the end times, miracles, worship styles, the role of women in church, church government, and on and on and on. Uh, churches are going to argue about those until Jesus comes back, and I'm thankful Jesus is going to set us all straight, aren't you? Amen. And I'm, I'm big enough to understand that some of the things that I hang on to right now are probably going to be things that Jesus looks at me and goes, really? Really? You held on to that? Uh, and, and you understand what I'm trying to say here. But what we're doing in this particular series, we started the very first week and talked about a Christian worldview. What is our mindset? And we talked about how important it was to have that. And so I have been using kind of a simple outline of what I call the essentials of Christianity. And I think they can be summed up in five phrases. Let's go ahead and put these up on the screen. And they are the Bible which we spent two weeks talking about. Grace, which we talked about last week. If you did not get to hear or watch that message, please go back and do so. Faith is our topic for tonight. Jesus is next week. And then the final week of the series, we're going to be talking about God's glory, which is not a topic that gets preached on very much. I, it's very important for me to point out to you that these five phrases stand alone. We need the Bible, but we don't need to add anything to it. We need grace, but we don't need to add anything to that grace. We need faith. We need these others. We need Jesus. We need God's glory. I think you get the idea here that in one sense, these five things stand alone. There's something important about them, and we'll pull all this together in just a little bit. But together, these five make up what I call the essential truths of Christianity. And we've been unpacking them because they're the core of what we believe. Now, I mentioned a couple of weeks ago when we were in the, the subject of the Bible that the Bible is not all that concerned about answering all of our questions, even though sometimes we treat the Bible that way. You know, I'm going to take this question to the Bible. I'm going to see if I can find an answer. And that's okay. But we come to the Bible with a thousand different questions about things like life and marriage and work and career and parenting and, and whatever the topic might be. We come to the Bible with a thousand different questions and we expect the Bible to answer all those questions. I was taught growing up that the Bible had the answers for everything. Weren't you? Okay. Um, but the Bible is not all that concerned about answering all of our questions. 
Rather, it is designed, the Bible's focus is designed to answer one question. And that one question is this. How are we made right with God? That's really what the center of the Bible is all about. How are we rescued? How are we saved? And those five phrases that I gave you summarize the answer to that question. Just think about this. The Bible tells us how we are made right with God, which is by grace, through faith, in the finished work of Jesus Christ, so that God and no one else gets the glory for everything that happens. And the fact that no one can add anything to those five topics puts all of the emphasis on God. So turn to the person next to you and just tell them very sweetly, it's not about you. Okay? Just tell them. Tell them it's not about you. I know some of you are going to be shocked by that. But what this does is it puts all of the emphasis on the fact that it's God who's moving toward us much more so than it's us moving towards God. Now, much of Christianity these days, I would say sadly, revolves around the idea that it is our responsibility to move towards God. The Christianity is all about us moving toward God. We talked about this last week. It's like climbing a ladder. You know, I'm going to climb a ladder and I'm going to get to God. But we need to make it very clear that our salvation is not about our movement toward God. It is all about his movement toward us. And it puts the spotlight on God's action for us, not on our action for God. And some of you are going, well, I don't, I don't understand this. I don't know why this is important. Why do we have to talk about this? Because most of us live a different way. We don't live according to what I just said. We live believing that we do have to find our way to God, that we have to work our way into God's good graces. But I want you to see this. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 says that Jesus is the author, which means initiator. He's the one who started all this. And finisher, he's not just the author, he's the finisher. So he brings all of this to completion. He is the author and the finisher of our faith, which is what we're going to talk about tonight. So God's rescue plan for us begins and ends with his love and his power and his initiative, not ours. And it's not just the beginning of it, it stays that way all through life. It is a gift that we receive, and you've heard this as long as you've been in the church, that salvation, that grace, all of this is a gift from God, and it's not a work that we achieve, but we don't believe it. We don't live it. But I also want you to understand something tonight. I'm going to make a statement and I'll explain it as we go along. This gift that Jesus has given us also includes your faith. Stay with me, okay? Nobody's going to sleep yet? Good. Now, we looked at the role of the Bible last week. We talked about the role of grace. This week we look at faith. And I, I put together a statement. And let's go ahead and look at this statement. It says, faith in what Jesus has done... In other words, do you believe in what Jesus has done for you? Do you accept it? Is it what you're trusting? Faith in what Jesus has done is the instrument by which we access all of his work for us. Jesus has done a lot for you and me. And we gain access to it when we believe, when we trust, when we put our faith in him. And because of what I just talked about, some people have concluded that faith is actually our work. Okay? Faith is what I do. Faith is my contribution. People think, okay, God does all of that stuff. He moves towards me. He initiates love towards us. But it's our work of faith that gets us in. And while God has done everything necessary for us, we have to bring faith to the table. This is what a lot of us have been taught, that faith is our work. 
But the Apostle Paul corrects this idea so clearly. Let's go back to the scripture that we started with. Let's go back to uh, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8. It says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. We'll stop right there. The people who think they have to work their way into God's good graces, they look at a verse like that and they go, Aha! I knew there was something that I had to do. You know, okay, yeah, God does everything, God does all of it, but I want to know what I have to do. Why are we this way? Is it because everything else in life is this way? You know, if you're going to work, you, you, you understand there's all kinds of things that we have to do, and, and we, we will agree. Yes, I've been saved by grace, but it's through faith, it says. So that must be my part. So their thinking is like this. It's okay. God has taken the ball 99 yards down the field. But now, it's my faith that will get me into the end zone. Doesn't that sound good? God will take the ball all the way down to the one yard line, and then who's, it, it's up to me. It's up to you. I have to believe. I have to trust. So God has done almost everything, but we don't get access to anything God has done until we bring the faith. Now, Paul knew that that's what we were going to think. So he adds a small statement right on the heels of this to show that even faith is a gift from God. Let's add a little bit to this. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and look what it says next, and this not from who? Not from ourselves. Not from us. It is the gift of God. Being saved is a gift from God. Grace is a gift from God. Your faith is a gift from God. Now, let me just make this very clear. The reason, there is one really good reason why he has to make this statement. It's because even if you and I contributed one small tiny thing to our rescue. Okay, God does everything except that little bit. Even if we contribute one small, tiny thing, guess what we would do? We would brag about it. We would boast about, wow, look what I did. You know, wow, God and I have scored a touchdown. Yeah, he might have done 99 yards, but I got it across, right? That's the way that we think. That's why, now let's look at the whole thing that we read earlier. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, verse 9, not by works, so that no one can do what? Boast. So that no one can boast. Nobody. Not you, not me, gets to take the credit for God's love being given to us. No one can say, wow, God loves me because I'm just so darn lovable. <laughs> or God rescued me because I'm so stinking rescuable. I don't even know if that's a word, but it, it fit. No one can say that. And that's what Paul is trying to make very clear. And, and the reason that I'm preaching this to us is because I believe this will, first of all, it's going to open up your mind to what Jesus has actually done for you and what you don't have to do for you. But I think it's also something you're going to be able to share with other people. Because they think that Christianity is nothing more than paying your dues, praying your prayers, going through the classes, memorize this, go there, go, you know, and on and on and on. And, and Paul is, is saying, no, 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 it's not that way. In fact, if you look at all of chapter 2, Paul diagnoses, like a doctor, the entire human race. He says, we all come into this world spiritually dead. If you're looking for a real boost to your ego, tonight's message is not that message. Okay? Any notion that we come into this world... And I've had good Christian people argue with me about this for years. Any notion that we come into this world basically good people is going to be demolished in this argument in just a second. Let's look what he says, starting in chapter 2, verse 1. 
So we're still Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1. Look what he says. He says, as for you, he's talking to us as believers, you were half dead, right? No, no, no. You were, all, you were, yeah, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you follow the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of air, the spirit which is now at work in those who are disobedient. And that would be who? That's Satan. He's at work in their lives. Verse 3. All of us also, Paul's including himself, lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts, like the rest. If you really needed to feel good about yourself, here it comes. We were by nature deserving of a candy bar. Oh, no, that's not a candy bar. Okay, it says de nature deserving of wrath. Whose wrath? God's wrath. The way that we live our lives every day, we deserve nothing but his wrath. And that's a pretty, that's a pretty negative description of us, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, so if you've basically been taught over the course of your life that you are a good person, you know, well, okay, well, maybe you're not perfect, but at the core of who you are, you're good. Paul says to that, you're nuts. You're crazy. And I've, I've been in arguments, so many arguments with people over this, over the years. You know, my, one of my favorite ones is people go, oh, oh, but look at the innocence of children. To which I want to say, you clearly don't have any kids, do you? <laughs> There is no one anywhere on planet Earth who is more selfish than an infant. Amen? They scream bloody murder at 3 a.m. in the morning for food. They don't care if you're sleeping. They don't care if you need rest. They want something and they want it when? Now. Right. You don't have to look past infancy to see human selfish, selfishness and self-centeredness. Despite our own experiences... And realizing that we are not born basically good, just in case we're tempted to think that way, Paul makes it very clear in that last thing that we read. He says, we are by nature children of wrath. What does that mean? We are at odds with God, naturally. That's how we came into this world. And that's a pretty serious diagnosis. But I want you to notice... We noticed this last week. Remember that whole section we read in Ephesians chapter 1? All of the verbs in those 11 verses pointed towards God and his goodness? Well, we're about to hit that again here in verses 4 and 5. Look at this. Notice where the emphasis is. But, verse 4, because of his great love for us. Whose love? Yes. Not ours, his God, who is rich in mercy. Who is rich in mercy? God is. Made us alive. God made us alive. We can't do this. In Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions. And here he says it again. It is by grace you have been saved. The entire emphasis right there is on God's action towards us. It's all about God's movement toward us. Understand this. We are not sick in need of a doctor. We are dead in need of a resurrection. And God does that. And nobody else can do that. So then when he gets all the way down to verses 8 and 9, he says that all of this saving that happens, happens by grace through faith. Understand, in this passage, up until verse 8, we were demolished. We were nothing, we were nobody, we needed help. But then you get down to verse 8, and I know some of us still want to think there's something we can do, right? It's like, wait a second, wait a second, there's some good news here. I do play a small part in this. I get to bring faith to the table. And Paul goes, time out, hold on, not true. Even this gift of faith it's a gift from God. You could say it this way. While God has done everything necessary for us, the idea that we might bring faith to the table, or that faith is our work, that is a contradiction. 
because even faith in God's work for us is itself a gift from God to us. The reason this is so important is that the God-given faith has Jesus as its object. This is not faith in you. And this is where we're going to come in to, we're going to come at odds with our culture. You, you just totally agree with everything the culture dishes out to you, right? Well, I'm about to show you where you and I have been brainwashed. And I want you to understand what we're talking about here. Some people have made a distinction between people of faith and people who are not of faith. Okay? You know, like there's two groups and only two groups. I have been asked on occasion, are you a person of faith? To which I would hope the obvious answer is yes, I am a person of faith. And so then if I return the question and I ask them, are you a person of faith? The normal answer I get is, not really. Not really, because they, they, they're, they're not really understanding what the word faith means. But can I just tell you this? When they say not really, it's not true. There is no such thing as people of faith and people who don't have faith. Every person is a person of faith. We all have faith. It is impossible to live one minute of the day without exercising some sort of faith. We all have faith. But what the question is, is what do you put your faith in? That's what makes all the difference. So again, the question is not, are you a person of faith or are you not a person of faith? The question is, what is the object of your faith? Who or what are you trusting in? Who or what have you put your faith in? And this God-given gift of faith that Paul is talking about is the only faith that has Jesus as its object. If you put your faith in me, I'm going to disappoint you. I am so sorry. If you put your faith in your spouse, they're going to disappoint you. I'm very sorry for that. If you put your faith in a government, if you put your faith in this or that and so forth, they are going to disappoint you. The God-given gift of faith has Jesus as its object, and it is this faith that gives us possession of everything that Jesus bought for us. Things like forgiveness and love and meaning and purpose and approval and hope and righteousness. So without faith in Jesus, we are left trying to secure all of these other things, all of this forgiveness, all of this hope, all of this. We are left trying to secure those things on our own. We try to secure forgiveness on our own. We try to secure love on our own. We try to, um, you know, by what we do and what we become and, and what we can get people to think about us and the way that we look, we try to secure approval on our own. You realize that's one of the biggest things we do our entire lives? We are trying to get the approval of other people. But without faith in Jesus, who gives us all this stuff for free, we have to try to get it for ourselves. In other words, without faith in Jesus, we have no choice but to put faith in, ourse in ourselves. It's one or the other. Either you trust in Jesus or you do not trust in Jesus, and that never ends well. Now, almost everything in this world, and sadly, in way too many churches, everything encourages you to put your faith in yourself got some quotes I'm going to go through here. Just, just You've heard these before, you've, in commercials especially. For instance, you have what it takes to meet life's greatest challenges and win life's greatest battles. Here's another one. Trust in yourself. Believe in yourself. If you have faith in yourself, anything is possible. We hear this stuff all the time. And that's the main message. It, it, it just more statements. If you're going to put trust in one person, let it be in yourself. Believe in yourself. Here's one. Trust your heart to do what it is guiding you to do. I always love that. that, that those are good in Hallmark movies. Just trust where your heart is leading you. Um, whatever. <laughs> yes, I've watched way too many Hallmark movies. But, you know, I, I just said that. Trust your heart 
And, and I think the prophet Jeremiah would disagree with us. He would say, that's a big mistake to trust your own heart. He said, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. So who can know it? Here's a good quote. The heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. Winston Churchill said that. So true. See, the idea that we can trust ourselves because our hearts are basically good and our intuitions are right, that's a farce. I mean, just look at the world around us. Pretty much everybody is doing whatever they want to do or whatever they think they can get by with. What does our world look like as a result of that? And what is it going to look like hundreds of years from now if we continue down the road that we're going? I love this one. Believe in yourself and you will be unstoppable. <laughs> Been watching one too many TED Talks, you know? I like TED Talks, but... And then here's, here's my favorite one. This was actually the subtitle of a book. And you know you're in trouble when the subtitle of the book is three times longer than the actual title of the book. Here's the subtitle. Believe in yourself and the universe will be forced to believe in you. I'm not even sure what that means. As if my greatest need in life is to get the universe to believe in me, right? And I understand all of this stuff sounds empowering at first. It sounds inspirational. That's how it ends up on a poster somewhere. But in a sense, do you realize what it's saying? It's saying, I am my own God. And I can do it by myself. Thank you very much. If it needs to happen, I will make it happen. I can pull myself up by my own bootstraps. And you want to know the first time this kind of thinking ever came into the world? All you got to do is go back and read Genesis chapter 3. Remember what the serpent said to Adam and Eve? Did God tell you that you can't eat from any of these trees? Which was a lie, okay? And they did say, no, he said we can't eat from this tree, but we can eat from all the others. And you remember what Satan says next. He says, you know why God tells you you can't eat from that tree? It's because he knows the moment you do, you will be just like him. And you won't need him anymore. And why would you choose to live dependent on God when you can be independent and be your own God? That's how this whole thing started. It's been running that way ever since. And from that point forward, we have been trying to play God. We do what we want to do. We decide what we like best. We determine for ourselves what's right and what's wrong. And the idea that we can be gods sounds empowering, doesn't it? Wow, all that power. But you and I both know, ultimately, this leads to slavery. It enslaves us. Faith in yourself never ends well. It's a dead end, and the thing is, we know it. When you're on the brink of despair, when you're experiencing a dark night of the soul, when things around you and things inside you seem to be unraveling, turning to yourself will bring you no hope. It will bring you no rescue. And it will bring you no relief. Faith in ourselves assumes that we have the internal power to get things right and the power to secure the things that we need most. The problem with that is we don't. I'm sorry, we don't. When we feel disappointed with life, when we can't overcome our bad habits and addictions, when we are paralyzed by the guilt of failing to be the mother or the father that we need to be, when we want to be loved but we're still single, when we get to midlife and realize we're not where we thought we would be, when we're focused on the mess ups that we can't change, plagued by the guilt of those things, when we are grieving over the death of someone who left us, all of those things. Does faith in your own ability help you at those times? Of course it doesn't. Why? Because the things that matter most, we can never make happen on our own. Maybe you will get a raise by working 80 hours a week. But you can't make your co-workers respect you. You can work hard to look good and act sweet, but you can't make him love you. 
You can do everything possible to impress your coach, but you can't fill the void that's left by the dad who never encouraged you. You can become successful in your career, but you can't make your daughter proud of you. You can say you're sorry a thousand times, but you can't make your son forgive you. When it comes to the stuff that matters most, faith in yourself will fail 10 out of 10 times. The deepest longings of the human soul, love, forgiveness, security, meaning, wholeness, all of those things go way beyond our own ability to come up with them. And you know it's true because you've tried before and it's never happened yet. Which is why people pay so much money these days to go and sit in self-help seminars. Which is why listening to motivational speakers for hours on end is so popular today. You want to know what it's really like? It's like putting a little band-aid on a gaping wound. It makes you feel better for a little while. It makes you think things are going to be okay. But then life happens. Amen? Does life happen? Life ever happen to you? You better believe it. What happens then? The noise goes away. And you're left by yourself. And you're left with your thoughts and your failures and your guilt and your insecurities and your fears. And it's in those moments, what do we realize? There's got to be something outside of me that can help me. There has to be something bigger than me that alone can set me free and rescue me. That means that the only hope we have for ourselves... Please try to understand this. The only hope we have for ourselves is to give up hope in ourselves. That's the only hope we have. Sounds really negative, doesn't it? To say that you have to give up hope in yourself. Well, the reason it sounds so negative is because we have been brainwashed into thinking that hope in ourselves is our salvation. That hope in ourselves is where rescue happens. That hope in me will get me to the other side and get me through this season. Let me ask you, has that worked so far? Really? Mm -mm. To put it plainly, the answer is not the elimination of faith. But the transfer of faith from me and what I can't do to Jesus and what he has already done and what he provides for me. It's the transfer of trust. From myself, my resources, my ability, my strength, my capabilities, I transfer all of that to Jesus and his strength and his accomplishments. Faith in Jesus involves two confessions. Go ahead and put them up on the screen. Two confessions. I can't and God can. Okay? Faith in Jesus involves these two things. Can you live this way? I can't do it, but God can. That's what real living faith looks like. You see, I cannot ensure that my kids are all going to turn out okay. I cannot ensure that she is going to love me till death do us part. I can't make that happen. I can't ensure that I will get to retire at a certain age because I've made all the wise decisions needed to do that. We think we can control a whole lot more than we can. We think we have the capacity to provide for ourselves much more than we actually can. The good news of the gospel, this is going to sound weird, the good news of the gospel only sounds good when it's put up against the bad news that says we can't do it. So, faith in Jesus is a dual confession. I can't, but God can. Now, I grew up believing that Christianity was for good people. Did you? Did you grew up believing you know, Christianity was for good people? Good people are Christian people, right? And non-Christian people are bad people? I'm going to be honest. I grew up believing that, okay? So the question is, how do you determine... Good people from bad people. Well, when you're a kid, what do you look at? Church attendance. Do you go to church? Well, you must be a good person. If you don't go to church, you're a bad person. That's what I grew up believing. But imagine my surprise 
when I later discovered that Christianity is not good advice for strong people. It's not even good advice for good people. Get this, Christianity is good news for broken people. Christianity is good news for people like you and me. We're broken and we cannot fix ourselves. We are the people who cannot make it on our own. We constantly fall short of God's standard of perfection, which it happens to all of us. And you've heard me say this. If you've paid attention to anything I've said over the last year, you've heard me say this more than once. That God loves and uses broken people who fail because there aren't any other kind of people. He loves broken people. He uses broken people. This twin confession of I can't and God can sets us free from the burden of trying to get for ourselves all that Jesus says here. Come and get it. Come and get it. Just, just come and receive it. It eliminates the need for the approval of other people, which, by the way, we spend most of our lives trying to secure. It sets us free from that because Jesus has already given us God's perfect approval and affection. So faith in Jesus gives us access to everything that Jesus has for us. And even this faith that we're talking about, it is a gift from God. So it's grace from beginning to end. All the way through. And in case you didn't know this, Jesus is the rock that we've been looking for so that we have a place to stand. And what we find in our search is that Jesus has already reached out for us and put us on that solid ground. I want to ask you to stand with me. We're going to pray together here in just a moment. Go ahead and stand. I want to pray a prayer so that if you understand what I've talked about tonight and you're saying, yeah, that's what I want in my life, I want that kind of faith, I want to believe in Jesus like that, then I want you to be able to start a relationship with Jesus. So we're going to bow our heads. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. And we're going to pray this prayer out loud, all of us. All I ask you to do, whether you've prayed this prayer before or not, is that if you pray it, I want you to mean it with all your heart. The Bible says in Romans that if we confess that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that he's risen from the dead, we will be saved. Please repeat this prayer after me. Dear Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Help me to live for you. Help me to love you all the days of my life. Today I'm new. Today I'm changed. Today I'm forgiven. And today I'm free. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. If you prayed that prayer for the very first time, please do not keep that to yourself. Tell somebody else that you just asked Jesus to lead your life. If you don't have anybody to tell, come up and tell me. But this is a start, isn't it? It's a start, and I can't wait. I get to preach a whole sermon, believe it or not, next week on Jesus. Oh, I'm so excited about that. All right, we're done. Have a great week, okay?